nasty comments, as in, Toddy, what are you saying? You're an idiot. We accept those too. We accept them gracefully, but uh, we like hearing what people think. So, and I'm really, um, I'm really happy you said that, Dennis, because I got that in the recording. So, uh... <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. Okay, thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, it there, as as Doug mentioned, I am, end up doing this often in April. Um, I enjoy doing April because we're beginning of the growing season. There's lots of things happening end of winter. So lots of things we can talk about. So we're going to dive right into things today because uh, we do have plenty to talk about. So we'll keep this moving so we can catch all the things. Again, this is a cooperation of a number of really good partners who are very much a joy to work with. It's always great to hear what people have to say, share comments, and even you know, quick throw things together. We had one more piece of information we thought we wanted to come up with this morning and uh, the two regional climate centers delivered information that was really great. Uh, next month, we're going to keep it in state here. I'm housed in, at Ames, in Ames, Iowa on campus at Iowa State, but we'll move down I-35 to Des Moines uh, where Justin Glisson, the state climatologist for Iowa at the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship will take off from there. So uh, keep it in state until we move it out the weekend, the, the month after that. So our agenda, as usual, current conditions, we'll touch on a number of impacts, those end of winter, spring, beginning of, uh, you know, beginning of growing season kinds of impacts, and then we'll look ahead uh, from an El Nino and general outlook standpoint. So thanks, Melissa Widholm from um, West Lafayette, Indiana, sharing a picture with us. So diving into uh, you know our, our current condition standpoint, uh, looking back at the month of March uh, from the NCEI graphics here, uh, kind of kept a similar pattern, though a little bit different than we have seen in previous months. We'll go to three. We'll look at the three-month ones here just after this. Uh, warmer than average, but more towards the, uh, the 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 coastal areas here, but still colder than average up in the plains. Uh, you know, down in the the top 30, top 15. Uh, North Dakota was in the top five coldest marches, largely because well, two things: a uh, general pattern situation where we you know the pattern colder air over the western U.S. And then that was reinforced over the, the northern plains by some heavy snowpack, which has had a number of different influences we'll touch on here as we go along. From a precipitation standpoint for the month of March, uh, kind of a mixed bag. Uh, Eastern Corn Belt overall has been, uh, was wetter, uh, not inc incredibly wet, uh, except for Indiana, uh, especially Southern Indiana caught, caught a lot more of the precipitation. So they were in the top 15 uh, wettest marches, uh, whereas Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas uh, were uh, much on, on the much drier side overall. Kansas, the 14th driest overall for the month of March. Uh, then I mentioned the three month ones. Uh, this is a continuation of a pattern we've seen throughout much of the winter, uh, much warmer than average. Uh, you know, from along the Mississippi River East, basically, uh, a number of top 10 warmest January through Marches on record, uh, top 10 all the way from Missouri over to Michigan and Ohio, uh, with, uh, you know, Ohio coming in at the second warmest uh, on record, uh, and then uh, Michigan being third, and in Indiana would be, uh, let's see, fourth, yes. Uh, whereas out in the plains, especially as you get over to the, the, the western plains and getting into the Rockies, Wyoming and Colorado on the cooler side, in between actually, um, you know, not excessively cold despite the amount of snow we had up there. And, and, and that those two do, do go together. When you're excessively cold, it's hard to produce a lot of snow because you can't support that amount of moisture. Uh, in, in this case, the plains were, you know, running middle of the road from a from a temperature standpoint. And then precipitation standpoint, something that we have talked about throughout much of the winter, uh, a very active winter from a precipitation. Uh, that uh, uh, Wisconsin coming in at number three wettest uh, January through March, uh, Michigan at number ten um, uh, wettest January through March, and then overall wet throughout our whole region except for uh, North Dakota and Kansas that are a little more middle of the road overall. Uh, one more thing to point out: this was shared from the Kansas State Climate Office, Matt Stell, uh, with if we go back a year. Um, 
we have can we have some counties in western Kansas that are the driest ever. Uh, that was 129 year period, so driest counties on record overall. Just wanted to point those out. And then since we are later in the month, just a quick look at precipitation where we are for the last 30 days. Uh, so total precipitation upper left hand side, percent of normal on the lower right hand side. And, and largely drier, uh, drier from the plains up into Iowa, parts of Minnesota, um, with some you know intervening uh, wet areas with a couple uh, with a couple uh, precipitation events, and then around the Great Lakes wetter, and then somewhat along the Ohio Valley somewhat wetter. Um, so uh, you know the Eastern Corn Belt generally has been wetter, but was more was drier here, and then very dry conditions that continue uh, will keep hitting on that situation. Uh, for initial spring planting, uh, this has been fairly good. Uh, we'll talk more about that later as we go along. And then uh, departure from normal temperatures uh, last 30 days, uh, continuation of that same pattern, generally warmer than average east, especially for in Michigan, you know, in three to six degrees above average. And then you can kind of figure out where the snow has been carrying on uh, over this time period with the much colder than average, you know, on the order of 12 to 15 degrees below average for a 30 day period. That's a pretty, that's a pretty impressive uh, difference from average uh, over a 30 day time period. Okay, so that kind of gives you a status on where we are. Let's dive into some issues and events here uh, that, uh, that 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 uh, have affected our situation uh, over you know over the last month. Um, continuation here, we mentioned snow. This is the amount of snow on the ground. Uh, this is a, a, a NOAA site. You can see the link below. Uh, no risk or no horsey. We we federal we federal folks like our acronyms. Um, but it is a real-time assessment of how much snow is on the ground and how much uh, water is on the ground. And it's, it, it does a, a quite a good job on, on the way of snow coverage. Um, so this is what we're back to at this point. We still have snow from Montana into North Dakota and then some uh, you know, around Lake Superior. Uh, but we've largely removed what we had recently. Let's go ahead and jump ahead to that. Here's where we were on the upper left-hand side as of April 6th, so that would be two weeks ago. This is the, the snow depth, and what you're looking at here is 16 to 20 plus inches of snow on the ground as of two weeks ago. And, you know, the eastern Dakotas over to Minnesota and, uh, and, and you know, up to the U UP of Michigan, uh, the southern, central to southern part of the Midwest was clear at this point. But we go ahead six days and look at what happened to that snowpack in six days. It was a remarkable, you know, th this was this was a very late snowpack, very late to have this amount of snowpack. Uh, temperatures had been cool that had kept it from moving along. Uh, so then we finally got warm. We'll talk more about temperatures here in just a little bit. We finally got warm into April and that was able to help move this. You combine that with the higher sun angle and we're able to move water very, move that snow very quickly. Uh, we're able to move the snow quickly, but the downside is, uh, you know, in this amount of snow, we had four to six inches of water in some cases. And so it's like you're putting a, a four inch rainfall event out there. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the water issues related to that. Uh, so that was, you know, that was truly very impressive. Um, just a, a graphic from, and it's a little bit, a little bit odd here, but uh, this is a graphic from, um, it's a product called Snowdas. Uh, it is the soil, the snow water equivalent. And this is uh, basically the, you know, kind of the Midwest from, you know, from the Minnesota, uh, over to Lake Superior and down to Illinois, Iowa, this is the amount of snow or the amount of water that was on the ground. And this compares over several years. Each of these bars is 2003 on the left-hand side going to present. So 85.7 millimeters of water, that's, uh, or millimeters of, yeah, of water. Um, I'd have to do my math real quickly and it's it's drawing a blank. But from a comparison standpoint, in the last 20 years in this area, this was the most snow we had on the ground. And it really was truly uh, a, a major amount of snow that we had over this area. Uh, keeping along with that theme, we set a number of records of uh, total amounts of snow for the year. And we're not done yet. Uh, we, you know, there is there is snow in, in some of these areas that that is still going to be happening or may still happen. So, uh, you know, from Duluth, 
you know, Rhinelander, Wisconsin, Riverton, Wyoming, um, down to the, the Twin Cities uh, in Minneapolis, and Glasgow, Montana, Winter, South Dakota, uh, top all top three uh, total snowfall amounts for winter to date. So again, this could this could be a, a difference. And there's a number of more major snowfall amounts that would rank up there, but these were the ones that fell in the top three. Really very impressive snow totals when you look at, at the year as a whole. Uh, what were some of the impacts related to those snows? Well, there there were a number of things in addition to the flooding, which again we'll talk about here, uh, there was uh, reports of increased stress and, and, and death of pronghorns and mule deer in Wyoming. Also some pneumonia issues, just too much snow and them not able to get access to feed. Uh, we would expect cattle out on the plains uh, to be having issues and they did. Uh, the prolonged winter required additional feeding because we didn't have access to grass. Uh, so, and there's a, a report from South Dakota of, of, of poor weight gain uh, because of some of the stress issues and, and, and needing more feed. Uh, with some of the cold that we had that extended into uh, the first part of April, that's a prime calving time. And uh, there were, uh, the, the, the report from South Dakota was, we're afraid to ask how many, what how the number of, of young livestock or calves lost because of the cold in this situation. Uh, also some issues with mud from cattle uh, getting stuck in the mud and some mortality and also breaking legs uh, because of being stuck in the mud. This seemed to be southern South Dakota overall. And then of course the flood and flooding that, that we're expecting to see after this. The other thing that I wanted to point out that really was truly impressive was the effect we, we mentioned the effect of temperature on snow and helping get rid of the snow, but there's also an interaction of the snow keeping temperatures from warming up very, very well. Uh, this was uh, the 24 hour period ending the morning of May or of April 12th. And you can, uh, as we're gonna, we're gonna play a game here and say, draw where you think the snow was in this picture. Uh, there was an incredibly impressive temperature difference that was not caused by an air mass difference. It was caused by a land surface difference. In this situation, we had uh, temperatures reaching the low 90s across central and southern South Dakota, while we had temperatures barely reaching the 50s uh, up in the northern part of South Dakota because of snowpack. And then you go ended up in North Dakota where the snowpack was, was more surrounded and it was it was even lower at that point. So it was, you know, you had about a 40 degree high temperature difference over the order of, you know, 100 miles or so. And there was not an air mass difference. It was simply snow on the ground uh, that was keeping those temperatures from, from, from warming up. Uh, that also kind of shows up here. Uh, these are daily high temperature records. Um, the up in the upper left for the the first week of April, April 1 to April uh, 7th, and on the lower right hand side, April 8th to April 14th. So warmer temperatures in the southern part of the region where there was not snow, and then as the snow went away and we had warm air moving northward, uh, lots of snow temperature records there. And then the lower left hand side, that, that same time period, uh, how many temperature records, daily records were broken, except for around that area where there was snow cover that kept those uh, overall warmer temperatures. So uh, the temperatures helped get rid of the snow. They've also, the, the temperatures have also been influenced. Uh, you know, just a reminder, we had very cold conditions right at the, the end of March, uh, beginning of April, quick warm up, and then we've gone back to some cold. But those warmer temperatures have also combined with some dry air to cause some interesting issues uh, that have caused some drying out of, of some of our surface soils. Um, the dry air, sunny skies, windy conditions have increased our, led to high evapotranspiration rates or evaporation from the surface since there's not much active growing just yet. We'll show you a graphic on that here in just a second. This is an example also from Trent Ford at, uh, at uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana with the um, with their warm network showing uh, the, the blue line shows what their soil moisture uh, uh, situation is at four inches, eight inches, and 20 inches. And, and what has happened, this is basically over a week period, uh, there was a big drop off at four inches and somewhat at eight inches, but not 20. Uh, he noted that this was the equivalent of a loss of an inch of water 
from a, just evaporation of the surface. That's how, how dry the situation is right now. And if you look at this product, uh, it's called Eddy, the Evaporative Demand Index, uh, that is uh, that sits on the NOAA website. Um, this isn't an actual amount of water that is being lost, but it it, it ranks evaporation, evapotranspiration, on, on the uh, drought monitor scale. Uh, so all across the Midwest and Northern Plains, you're somewhere on that, except for the you know the very north in Minnesota here, somewhere on that drought monitor scale, some D1, but some fairly widespread D2, D3 level evaporative demand. So in cases, in, in places where we're wet, this is not a bad thing. In places where we have some dry soils, this is not good news for us. And so it's been, again, good for people trying to get in the field, not so good for places where we have very dry soils. Okay, where we are dry, we start thinking that, okay, fire is an issue and, you know, fire in the spring is not uncommon. Uh, from all reports, fortunately, it seems that the fire issues have, have been relatively minor. A number of states in the plains and even all the way up to Wisconsin, have reported fire starts, uh, some of them uh, unplanned, but a few of them, it was kind of hard to tell sometimes if they were they were planned burns uh, from the spring, but most of them have been relatively small, people noted that we, they were able to be controlled. So uh, despite the dryness, uh, not, not major issues. The other part about this, uh, we should mention too, that some of these were areas that are dry, some of the areas like in Wisconsin is wet, but it's been cool enough that we've not had green up. So we're needing green up so that, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, limits some of the active burning potential. Uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of where we are from a fire standpoint. Fortunately, it's not been a major fire spring. Uh, so that's been a positive. Now, there were a few comments that people had and some people questions to say, uh, you know, what's been the wind situation? Again, our, our, our wind climatologies are not quite as good and not quite as detailed as some of our temperature and precipitation climatologies, but we threw this in. Um, nothing, so far this year, no, there haven't been any, and I, you can tell I'm, I'm, I'm intelligent because I use no major different. Um, I need to learn how to write someday. Really, there have not been any major differences overall from a climatological standpoint. Uh, January and March were generally below average. February was somewhat above, but not, nothing major overall. This is a graphic from March, so most of the eastern part of the area was slightly windier than average. And actually, in the northern plains, it was somewhat uh, less windy uh, comparatively. Uh, so it's it's there's um, really largely nothing to write home about. In April, the folks from Kansas noted that they had been, um, I think, about a, a half mile per hour. Uh, windier during the month of April so far. So, but nothing, again, nothing to write home about. And noted the number of red, red flag warnings uh, that has been fairly frequent all through the area. Uh, windy and dry conditions do that. Uh, also, when you have a surface that's not greened up, it's conducive to that. And um, Steve Vavris from, from Wisconsin uh, shared a graphic, which I didn't include here, that they had a red flag warning with uh, various spots where they had flood warnings. And again, the situation there was not that they were too dry, it was they had not been able to green up yet. And Dennis, so that, what, is a red yes. flag, what is a red flag warning? Good point. Red flag warning, well, you tell them what a red flag warning is. You were closer to the weather service than I am. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that people understood that that just meant that the uh, incidence of fire was uh, elevated, basically, is what that means. There's a red flag meaning, um, Lots of wind, probably dry air, and thus a uh, chance for fire uh, is enhanced. <clears throat> and quick moving fire if it does get started. Uh, that, that is the highest category that you'll see. There are some lower categories the Weather Service will put out uh, that, that are not quite as, as concerning, but red flag days are, are days that people should take note and be careful of fire. Um, thanks, Doug. Also, it has been a fairly enhanced early severe weather season. Uh, this is a, a graphic from uh, the NOAA Storm Prediction Center uh, indicating the, uh, you know, all these dots are severe weather reports for this year so far, January 1st to April 17th. Uh, you see, uh, you know, a number of days. Uh, this, this big one that shows up was the March 31st, April 1st severe weather event uh, that 
um, set off a number of reported tornadoes uh, from Illinois over to uh, Illinois, Indiana, I think were two of the biggest areas in that one. Um, you know, it was a, a record-breaking severe weather outbreak. Uh, Illinois, I think it was the, the most tornadoes on a day on record and, and not too far away from their most tornadoes on any given day at any time of year. Um, and Indiana also reported, uh, uh, you know, some a, a amount of big amount of severe weather on that day too. Uh, this is a, a picture of Robinson, Illinois, from uh, National Weather Service Lincoln, uh, that was that was hit by uh, by a tornado. Um, so far, up in the plains, uh, it's been a relatively quiet severe weather season. Yeah, it's a little bit early for them, and because of the cold conditions, that has kept them largely from from getting into too much of the severe weather events. Okay, we've kind of covered some other things. Let's get at it. water issues. There's, as we would expect, a wide range of water issues that we have going on, some too much, some too little, unfortunately, across our region. Um, you know, I, this is from a Glarel, uh Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab. I'm, that's a, it's a NOAA acronym, so I'm guessing it, on that one. And then a, a graphic from Castleton, North Dakota, shared from us by uh, Adnan Akius, the North Dakota state climatologist. Um, they are just getting rolling in the way of flooding up in that area. Okay, so where are we from a stream flow standpoint? Kind of gives you an indication on, on some of the wetter areas, drier areas, especially from a water available standpoint. Okay, working our way from, from east to west, uh, we are getting a little bit dry in the eastern part of our region, Ohio, Indiana. Um, the, the, the lack of rainfall in the shorter term is showing up in stream flows. Overall, soil moisture, which we'll catch next, is not too bad, but we're starting to, you know, starting to get a little bit dry over in that area. Uh, the green from Michigan down through Illinois and uh, southern parts of uh, Missouri here is middle of the distribution, so, so nothing too much to point out here. Uh, Iowa down to the plains, you can see quite a bit of a, you know, quite a very low stream flows comparatively, and that's indicative of some of the dry areas, which we'll again talk more about as we go along here. And then this area all across the north, we're still dealing with the effects of the melt off from that snow. Um, most of the area we, we've, we've eliminated the overland when you just have so much snow that has to be melted, uh, you'll get overland flooding. Most of that has largely been eliminated. Uh, we're now getting into more river, major river flooding we'll talk about as we go along here. Still having a few problems up in North Dakota where they still have the snow in that area. So uh, stream flows, uh, you know, higher or highest on record. And in some cases, you know, this is a combination of one, a big winter snow, and then you combine that with a late meltout. Uh, so it's leading to very quick quick conditions. Uh, in the west, we'll have to keep an eye on because we have a pretty decent snowpack in the mountains. When that comes out, then that will uh, lead to a secondary peak uh, as we go along on some of our streams out in that area. Okay, to look at the soil moisture standpoint, uh, again, we've got a, a variety of different products, different ways of trying to look at what's going on. Uh, you see a little bit of that drying out in the eastern Corn Belt. I think this may be overdone just a little bit, but starting to dry out. So far, this has just been favorable for, for crops uh, and getting in the field. Nothing too major yet. Uh, some wet up around the Great Lakes, that dry area in the plains into Iowa, which we, is, is well known and well documented. We'll show some pictures along the way. Our real question mark area is parts of the eastern Dakotas and Minnesota. And we say that, you say, well, okay, we've had all this water and, and, and snow, but underneath parts of, large parts of this area, we've had largely frozen soils. So that water has come off and saturated the surfaces, but those frozen soils probably have, have limited, in some places, water getting into the soil. So we may, and we know in some places, we're still gonna have some relatively dry soils even after having all this snow on it. The problem is it may be very episodic and, and hard to tell from place to place. So that's something we're gonna continue to keep an eye on as we go along. And certainly some of these northern areas will still want to have some rainfalls here even after all the snow that they had. Okay, from a mountain snowpack standpoint, uh, 
you know, the, the, we're, despite the, you know, that all the eastern parts of the Rockies uh, being above average, we're the low area, you know, the western parts here, the, the percent of average is, are truly amazing from some of these areas. You've heard the reports from California particularly. Uh, you look up here, up in Mon Montana, this, there's a monstrous percentage up here. That's because typically there's very little snowpack up in that area. But most of the river basins that flow east are right at or above average for this time of year. So we still have a decent amount of water that's going to come down out of this area. The whole western area is going to be something very interesting to see as we go along here. Okay, a summary of some of the water issues. Again, flooding is going to continue to be an issue. Most of, as I mentioned, most of it is along the major rivers at this point. Uh, the Big Sioux in South Dakota and the Minnesota, I think, are, are mostly past their peak. They still have, you know, water issues, but the uh, unless we get some additional rainfalls, uh, they're past most of their major problems. The James River in South Dakota and the Mississippi River are, are getting rolling, uh, you know, flooding and going to continue to see that increase. Uh, the Mississippi is reported to possible top three all-time crest north of La Crosse, Wisconsin. As, you, as we move further south, the potential for, for major flooding is less because there's less coming in as we go along. Um, you know, mountains just reaching the, 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 the peak snow, so that melt off is going to continue rolling here. Uh, the Milk River in Montana has seen some flooding. They're going to see some more as we get some of the, the melt off from there. Uh, eastern areas, mostly normal, some drying. Um, there's been some delayed ice out because of the late cold in Minnesota and some reported winter kill issues because uh, low water levels going into the year. Uh, and then uh, cold during the winter and, and ice. So there are decent amounts of fish kills related to that. Here we are looking at the Missouri River Basin, uh, where we are in the way of snowpack uh, at this point. Uh, this, the, the total above Fort Peck and then Fort Peck to Garrison on the right-hand side. We have reached our peak and starting to fall off. That's what the blue areas are pointing here. And we're right about that peak time uh, of, of peak mountain snowfall. So it's, it's nice to have slightly above average snowfall in that area to help uh, get water back in the Missouri River system that's been hit by drought the last few years. Uh, on the Platte River Basin, um, you know, the South Platte coming from Colorado is, is close to average. It's dropped off a little bit here. The North Platte, on the other hand, is quite a bit different, quite a bit more snow in the North Platte. So we're expecting some pretty good runoff into that area. Um, from, the, from a Great Lakes standpoint, um, temperatures on the Great Lakes, which we'll show next, are running a, above average. Um, you know, there was not a great ice cover this year uh, because of the, the lack of overall, overall cold. Um, total ice cover uh, existing right now is 3.6%. So, so pretty low for this time of year. I mentioned there was discussion uh, during our meeting yesterday about you know, lake temperatures still being cold, but all the lakes are running slightly above average, uh, you know, uh, by, by some level, though, uh, you know, and it was, it was pointing out that the, you know, there was contrast between the very warm air temperatures and maybe wanting to enter the lake, but noting that the lake temperatures are still very, very cold overall. Okay, so touch on where we are with the drought monitor. Uh, we're looking at a situation with uh, with you know the overall wetter conditions to the east. Really, no no major drought problems. Still, those on with the dry soils and and not as much precipitation during the winter. Ongoing drought issues, uh, largely from western Iowa, Nebraska down into Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, some improvement up in the Northern Plains area, which again, with all that snowpack, we did need to reflect some improvement, but ongoing issues because we're still not sure exactly what our soil moisture situation was like, and then a lot of improvement that we've seen out west. Zoomed up in just a little bit on that, again, to give you a better idea, uh, but uh, you know, so these are our concern areas, most particularly Nebraska, parts of Iowa, and, and Kansas, Kansas sitting at about 43% D4, I think was the number we were dealing with. Though from a change standpoint, uh, on the upper right-hand side, our, our, our 12 week or three month change is, uh, you know, we, we have shown some improvement throughout the Northern areas with some worsening in Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, 
parts of Colorado, the areas that, that have seen problems. I uh, should also point out uh, far southeastern Colorado uh, is also similar in, in, in uh, drought problems to what we see in Kansas and, Nebraska, or Kansas and Oklahoma. Okay, let's jump to where we are from an ag standpoint since we're starting to get into the main part of the growing season. Um, you know, further north, uh, looking at a soil temperature standpoint, soil temperature is still cold further north because we've just gotten rid of the snow. We still have to get rid of some snow and we have to warm up and we haven't had widespread enough temperatures, warm enough temperatures to move things along. Southern uh, South Dakota over to, you know, Southern Wisconsin and, and most of Michigan and South temperate soil temperatures are in the upper 40s to 50s or warmer, which would be conducive for planting corn. We'll talk about corn, uh, you know, where we are in planting aspects overall here yet. So, uh, you know, this is about the time of year people want to get rolling and we're starting to see that. Uh, up here, these delays are, are being noted, but not a major concern at this point. I, I'm, I'm more concerned overall with the soil temperature and, and, and not getting warm enough temperatures to warm things up than I am about overall wetness from a soil standpoint up there. Okay, where are we from a, from a crop standpoint? And um, I, I will note that the, these maps, which we have shown other years, are now available. And I don't believe, I'll have to see if I included this somewhere here, these maps are available at the National Drought Mitigation Center website. Um, so you can get them and not have to, you can watch us, but you can get them more directly when they come out each week. Where are we on a winter wheat standpoint? Um, you know, we're still early. Winter wheat heading is down in, in southern areas. Uh, the good to excellent conditions are mostly, as we would expect, those wetter areas from Missouri over to the east. While as winter wheat conditions poor to very poor, uh, you know, we're at 60% poor to very poor uh, in, in, in Kansas. And, uh, you know, they went in dry in the fall. They've actually been hit by some cold during the winter and the ongoing dryness continues to hammer on winter wheat. From an overall standpoint, we are the lowest winter wheat condition uh, in, in, you know, in the 21st century. Uh, there are some similar some similar uh, numbers back in 1995, 96, uh, but that was actually a flip situation where some cold in early 1996 had hammered on the eastern winter wheat areas, while the plains area winter wheat was was somewhat better that year. Touching where we are on some other crops, again we're still early, uh, but corn planting is is rolling along. You see 30% in Missouri, 10% uh, in Illinois, 14% Kentucky. And then uh, smaller amounts in states around them, uh, as as you know, we're we're not quite far enough along yet. Spring wheat is you know in South Dakota, we have a little bit going on there, and some in Montana. Oats starting to get rolling a bit more in Iowa, where it's been conducive for planting. And then uh, we have this odd change we've seen in encouragement of people plant soybeans ahead of corn. That's a very uncommon thing, but uh, we've seen uh, you know some soybean planting moving along here. Uh, from a perennial and other uh, ag standpoint, uh, just pointing out it's been very interesting in that we, we mentioned that the very warm temperatures in the southeast and eastern U.S. moved uh, the phenology, uh, you know, the first spring leaf from the National Phenology Network was quite early, uh, you know, up to two to three weeks early. And then the cold that happened in March really slowed things down actually was somewhat beneficial for some of the perennials around the Midwest because it kept them from quite reaching the point where they could have been had frost damage. We've actually moved now, you see this big blue area, and this was noted by Becky Bollinger from Colorado, uh, Eastern Colorado, parts of, of Nebraska and South Dakota. Uh, phenology is actually later because of the cold conditions, we, you know, not getting to green up. And then you see Northern areas of, of Michigan and Wisconsin, the warmth has pushed them along overall. All right, that gets us kind of caught up on our overall conditions. Let's touch on where we're going from the outlooks. Okay, again, check on El Nino ENSO status. We are in a transition going on here, seven day, eight to 14 day, and then the monthly and seasonal outlooks, and then we'll kind of wrap things up here. Okay, first from the National Weather Service River Forecast Center, what are we expecting in the way of river outlooks? This is mainly along the, the Mississippi River and red areas that we have, I mentioned earlier, we've transitioned from, from mostly overland to the major river systems that are, are flooding right now. 
uh, Minnesota and the, the Minnesota River here in southern Minnesota and to the Mississippi River are the, you know, the, the red as significant flooding is occurring. That's going to start tailing off here. We're expecting more as we're going down along the Mississippi, some here into, into Wisconsin, a bit in the, Union, uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. The Red River is just getting rolling now as we're still moving that. And remember, this is a very flat area. It takes a while for it to move for its, its further way north. And then we don't, this doesn't include the Missouri River Basin area. The Big Sioux I mentioned mostly passed my, the major flood issues, uh, but the James River, because we're still getting water coming down from North Dakota, the James River is, is gonna be reaching flood stage and, and tends to stay with us for a while that way. Okay, the bigger issue we always talk about, not because it is the overall impact of everything, but it does give us some ability to look ahead and give us an idea on conditions is where we are with El Nino, La Nina. Uh, La Nina is officially dead. Uh, you know, we're out of La Nina. And now we're watching the possible very rapid transition to the opposite phase, El Nino, um, which we're, we're seeing this graphic, which has put us in what's called an El Nino watch, like the, the, the National Weather Service severe weather conditions are, 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 are favorable for development of an El Nino. We're not at an advisory level yet, we're just at a watch. And, and this is indicating what the potential for this is. A uh, reminder, these are each of the three month periods going, going out to March, April, May, all the way to November, December, January. And then each of the bars shows the probability of being either La Nina, neutral, or El Nino. You see no, you know, only small amounts of La Nina, so it's likely not to happen. We're going to be in neutral conditions for the spring and into early summer. And then all bets are off because the, the models are indicating this possible rapid transition to El Nino conditions. Again, we're at a time where there, there's less confidence in the models because we're in that spring predictability uh, period. But a number of models are indicating the same thing, that there is a fairly rapid transition coming to El Nino conditions and possibly a, a quite a strong El Nino. So this is going to continue to watch as we're going along. The outlooks in the near term don't reflect anything with El Nino as you look out into the fall or especially winter, uh, they do reflect an El Nino influence. Okay, next seven days, what are we looking at in the way of precipitation? Uh, more precipitation to the south of us and the storm system that is moving, currently moving across North Dakota to the north, uh, uh, you know, amounts up to an inch maybe in the way of liquid but not huge amounts of precipitation it looks like over the next seven days. So we'll, we'll get a little bit of a chance to dry out overall. We unfortunately are seeing, expecting to see some very cold conditions move down through the region. And we do now have perennials that are uh, at potential impact, you know, some tree fruits and, and some tree fruits in, in Illinois and alfalfa and, and Minnesota and probably other areas that are susceptible to some freeze damage. We'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. And unfortunately, there are hints that this could persist into the early part of May with uh, you know a, a slight tilt towards below average conditions likely. It doesn't look like it's going to be severely cold for the whole time, but we're going it does look like it's going to stay on the cool side. So that will slow some crop development. Overall precipitation, a slight hint towards below, so it doesn't look like major precipitation events coming overall. Jump ahead to the May temperature and precipitation outlooks. Um, lots, you're gonna see lots of white now. When we're in neutral conditions, uh, the Climate Prediction Center doesn't, you know, doesn't take a lot of, or doesn't show a lot one way or the other. So you're gonna see a lot of white for equal chances. So some cold uh, hinting at, Again, with a pattern, and again with you know some colder soils and wetter soils up there, uh, a slight tilt towards below, large area of you know not one indication or the other, um, and then around the Great Lakes for for May, uh, a hint that maybe drier than average up around the Great Lakes, um, and then lots of EC around the rest of the area, which is for drought areas a mixed bag, not indicating continued dryness, but you know maybe not the wet that we'd like to see to improve conditions. Then the, the 90 day May to July, we do see a, a slight hint towards warmer in the May to July period, and also a bit wetter out in the, the Ohio Valley, Eastern Corn Belt area, uh, with lots of in between, maybe some hints towards below, uh, way up into, into uh, Montana there. 
And then I, I threw one in just June through August, taking one more step, a uh, very typical summer pattern in the outlooks, lots of EC equal chances through the middle of our area, surrounded by a slight tilt towards warm. That's mainly trend is what that's based on overall. And then uh, hint again, continued towards the wetter and the Eastern Corn Belt. So um, overall, the, from a risk standpoint, from a crop production standpoint, uh, you know, the, the, the removal of El Nino does reduce our risk overall, but we still do have some concerns about the dryness that we have out in the plains. And then you combine these issues uh, from Climate Prediction Center, the drought outlook through July, there are hints towards uh, some more reduction out in this area. And this is basically um, leaning on climatology. This is the time of year when you have the most precipitation and evapotranspiration or crop water use has not picked up yet. So this is the time of year to, to make some improvement. Unfortunately, the southern parts of our region, Colorado, Kansas, uh, there's more concern about the, the, the risk continuing without being able to see a whole lot of improvement. And then from a fire standpoint, the expectations are that, uh, you know, mostly uh, normal to maybe slightly below normal further north in those wetter areas from a, from a wildland fire potential. Okay, quick summary on conditions. Generally wetter to the east, drier to the west, except for that area north that has been, has seen the more, the more uh, snow, though we may still have some drier soils underneath that. Uh, warmer east, cooler west. We still do have drought issues persisting in the plains. Uh, that we've made some improvement, but still have quite a ways to go on. Soils are still pretty cool to the north. Uh, south, we've been, you know, they're warm enough, uh, so we've been able to make some progress. Uh, definitely snow melt issues in the rivers, and we are not done with snow. There's still some more snow uh, going to be coming uh, as we're going along here that's going to have to melt and be moved along. Uh, so the lack of additional uh, rainfall or without major rainfall is, is good from that flooding standpoint. Um, and then, uh, you know, other long-term drought issues, surface water issues, and rangeland winter wheat issues out in the plains that, you know, with the lack of precipitation, we've not been able to move, make uh, great strides on. Okay, from an outlook standpoint, La Nina is gone, uh, transitioning to El Nino. Uh, how quickly we transition to El Nino and the strength of the El, El Nino seem to be more of the question right now. Uh, it's not a guarantee the El Nino is going to happen, but it looks fairly likely it's more how soon do we get there and how strong is the El Nino when it happens. There is potential for this being a very strong one right now, but again, the predictability is, is a bit more limited right now. Uh, this does, again, reduce some of the wider scale drought risk in the growing season, but those areas that are in drought, we still have problems with. Um, Overall, lower confidence in the outlooks when you don't have an El Nino or La Nina because you don't have that, that backing in, in the way of patterns to look at overall. Um, overall, better chances of warmer and wetter to the east. These are not strong, but that's the, all we have to go on. And lots of not much we can say in the plains. So again, that's good news, bad news. Um, bad news in that we don't see wet that would improve things but good news and we don't necessarily see continued dryness. So maybe we start working, you know, inching away at those drought conditions. Okay, a bunch of uh, websites where you can find some of the additional information related to these. We invite you to, to check those out. Um, people who uh, can check in and, and help out with you here answer, answering other questions. And thank you very much. We went through a lot. I appreciate you sticking with me through this. I hope you have some good questions, some tough questions that I can give to Doug to be able to answer. Thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah, we have some comments. Uh, one is, and it's something that uh, our good friend Becky Bollinger from Colorado uh, State Climate Office mentioned is that far below average precipitation in Southeast Colorado for April so far. And uh, I guess if you look at the latest, um, uh, drought map, you'll see that uh, conditions are reflected that way as uh, especially last week to this week, they're in, in, increasing the amount of uh, uh, drought severity, if you will, in terms of uh, that, that, that part of Colorado. I think you passed it already. Oh, I was actually going to go back to the last 30 day precipitation map near the beginning. Um, okay. Yeah, there we go. So, Last three days precipitation. Yeah, we're looking at 
you know, much less than an inch, much less than half an inch in some places. Right. And I mean, compared to normal, yeah. you can look down there in the lower right and see that it's <laughs> yeah, 25% or less uh, in most places. So anyway, uh, so we're, we do recognize that. I think the state climate office there in Colorado um, sort of has that under uh under control, if you will, <laughs> under control from the fact of, of, of monitoring it. Um, I was also pointed out that the red flag is used, red flag warning is also used for boaters, which is a big deal, of course, on any lake <clears throat> and such. Um, Dennis, this one's for you. Uh, okay. What, what effect will yesterday and today's widespread rain in Iowa have on soil streams and uh, soil streams, et cetera? And you can include other. Uh, you don't have to just focus on Iowa. You could uh, maybe talk about any place that was hit. Sure. Um, the the amount of rain you know we saw around an inch, some places two inches. Western Iowa, uh, up into Minnesota, a little bit of Nebraska. That is a really good thing. Uh, we'll need about two more of these in the next uh, month, but. This will put a lot of smiles on producers' faces because um, it's dry enough now to start planting, and that's a good thing, but they know they've got some dry soils to deal with. Uh, from a stream standpoint, I, it will only have a minor effect in that a, a lot of water will be taken up by soils. The only place you'd probably see much runoff were some of the places where we saw some isolated heavier amounts, and you get a little bit of runoff there. So this was definitely a good thing. Yeah, um, and generally, of course, we want to see the slower rainfalls than the heavy, uh, super heavy um, rainfall events that happen in an hour or two. Um, also, this time of year, Dennis, you might want to reflect on the fact that uh, uh, soil infiltration may be a little bit better this time of year, and you don't, it's not so much evapotranspirated right away as it is later in the year when everything's growing um, bank, uh, you know, gangbusters. Correct. Um, and, and that's why, you know, that's why the drought outlook does show some possible improvement in the plains area, despite not seeing, you know, expecting above average precipitation. This again, the two times where we see soil moisture recharge are one in the fall, because usually soils are pretty dry in the fall, crops have tapped them out. So you get water back in the soil especially north, you freeze up over the winter. Eastern areas have seen some recovery over the winter because they don't freeze up. Now, as we're starting to get planted and before things are very actively growing, uh, this is a time you can get more water back on the ground. You are seeing evaporation from the surface, but you don't have um, a crop growing that is extracting water from deeper in that soil moisture profile. So it is a time of year, typically we would see some recharge. And, and it is also a time for, it's easier for the water to enter the soil because we're not frozen. And especially now we're not dry. If soils were very wet or saturated, like we have seen at times, we would see a lot more runoff. Uh, Dennis, you and I can tag on this one. What do you, how do you speak to the importance of the current very negative, by the way, PDO condition uh, regarding the outlook? And I don't remember that coming up in the conversation on Tuesday. Um, PDO is the 10 to 20 year cycle, if you will, um, in the Pacific. So, so right now we're seeing cooler than normal temperatures along the coast. I think that's an, uh, one of the indicators of PDO. Yes. Yeah. It, it is a bigger effect along the coast out there. Um, it, there has been work done that shows an interplay between the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and El Nino, La Nina. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head, there are phases of those that tend to reinforce each other yep. and phases of those two that tend to work counter to each other. And yep. I'd have to go back and recall which one is which. So, so one thing, I don't know if you said this, Dennis, um, maybe I wasn't paying attention, <laughs> but I won't admit that. Um, but uh, <laughs> some of the forecasts that you showed didn't show a lot of uh, high probabilities, especially when it came to, I think it was May, and that's indicative of this switch, if you will, uh, number one, from La Nina potentially to El Nino or, or to neutral, actually. Um, it, it, it tend, this time of the year is, is, is really difficult in the monthly time scale, especially to, to pinpoint what is going to happen in the next 30 days. Um, 60, 90, it gets a little better. Um, 
but uh, all these things are interacting with each other and it's a flux, you know, we're going into this, it, it's changing. Uh, the situation in the atmosphere is changing because the ocean's changing, right? All right. And, and it's also the time of year when we're changing, you know, the jet stream is moving northward, the storm patterns are changing overall, and convective precipitation is much more difficult to project than, than larger scale systems. So those all play in to lead to bigger questions about what happens in the outlooks. It leads into the next question, which is, the, is the transition from La Nina to El Nino? creating any extra problems in making short range forecasts. I would say if you mean short range being um, in the next seven days, not really. Um, but if you're talking about, like we said, uh, let's say week three and four in the future or beyond, yes, definitely. And and we're running into, we're running also running into eventually into the summer here, things get a little less, uh, uh, easy to forecast from a El Nino El Nino point of view, and you have to rely on different different aspects of, uh, of forecasting actually uh, to have any accuracy whatsoever. It's it's harder in the summer than it is in the winter. Um, can you show the fire potential slide again, Dennis? And maybe um, I don't know what you said on the fire potential one, but uh, it's generally due to relatively wet conditions not overly um not overly exciting i think yeah there was not uh you know and the the only place that there was concern was actually outside our region to the west um you know idaho and 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 the pacific northwest uh, parts of montana and north dakota lean towards below normal chances because uh they are you know, because we've we've been wetter in the near term, and then most of the rest of the area is near normal. So yeah, yeah. I, I find that interesting. And in, you know, in some of the plains, how dry we've been that they're they're not somewhat elevated in that area. But right. at this point, still considering near normal. Right. And normal though, normal means there will be some fires. Yes. It doesn't yes. mean there won't be. It just means there will. Uh, it means it'll be closer to normal than it will be uh, significant. Uh, significantly great. Um, how far north, and I think, the, I think the question should be how far south, do you estimate the current risk for frost freeze to seasonal ve vegetation? And I think we're talking about the next uh, seven days in this one. Correct. And guy, I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at, I guess we did talk about that a bit yesterday, that we could see potential for for freezing conditions. Yeah. Like you know, uh, all the way down into Missouri, well into Illinois, into that area. Um, definitely have some concerns in those areas, you know, down to Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, where things have been growing actively for a longer period of time. We have, uh, you know, winter wheat that is growing would be more susceptible. Uh, certainly uh, horticultural plants a number of them would have reached a point that would be more of a problem. I mentioned alfalfa further north. Um, you know, those the, the the Dakotas, Minnesota, the overall risk may not be quite as bad because things haven't had a chance to progress as much. But there is it it's there's this odd interplay because you it's it's how far is whatever plant you're concerned about, where is it in its phenology? And there's different levels of susceptibility to freeze in different phenologies. So you're trying to forecast how low a temperature are we going to reach and and what is at risk in those areas. So it's 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 kind of a tough interplay. So very quickly, uh, it, I, I'm just pulled up something really quick. So take us for what it's worth. Um, low temperature Saturday night, uh, they have 29 down in Springfield, 29 degrees down in Springfield, Missouri. Um, and then the next night, Sunday night thus, uh, that cold, coldest air sort of is a little further west, east uh down to 32 as far south as oh oh south of louisville Frank, um somerset i guess it's somerset kentucky actually so the middle of, of kentucky but it's not yeah so so we see freezing but uh, as dennis said it may really depends on the vegetation what you know how long it's going to stay cold and it doesn't look like it's going to stay cold for too long so that's good. Um, let me go back to uh, questions here. Okay, 
they keep lining up. Um, Red River of the North, uh, can you get that graphic back up? Red River of the North, uh, will it result, and, and the real question is, will it result in widespread prevent planting? Um, will there be prevent plant up there? Probably yes. For those of you not on the ag sector, prevent plant is a part of crop insurance that if you're not able to get into a field, put your crop in, you receive a settlement uh, because of that. Uh, so you're not trying to get into a field that's too wet. Um, we will probably see some. How widespread is, is a tough call um, because we do have a lot of water to move out of there. It doesn't move along that quickly, uh, but we're still relatively early. And the other part of this I, I had mentioned before is our big flood problem years in the Red River have been where you put a lot of snow on top of a very wet fall. We weren't that wet this fall. So the soils are not in incredibly wet. So they have some ability to take some of this up. Is it still gonna flood? Yes. Are we still gonna see some problems? Yes. How widespread? I'm, I'm not sold still yet that that's gonna be a huge problem. Uh, yeah, not a record. <laughs> uh, so what might be the impacts of a strong El Nino in this region? And, uh, and, and the, uh, David, the, the answer to that is, um, if this does number one turn into an El Nino and then number two turn into a moderate and or strong one, um, it's it's sort of the it, it is the opposite of what uh, we expect from a La Nina, which is what El Nino brings uh, in this in the winter time warmer than normal temperatures in the northern states, cooler than normal temperatures in the southern states of the U.S. Um, and wetter conditions along the south and drier conditions along the north. That is a super general statement, but uh, that's what uh, El Nino tends to do. Um, it tends to have a split jet stream, meaning that the south, the southern part of the U.S. gets, uh, gets more activity. The northern part is sort of the northern jet, if you will, splits over the top. It stays in Canada. We don't get as many Arctic pushes, uh, Arctic air pushes. It doesn't get as cold. And we have a relatively, relatively warm uh, winter. Dennis, do you want to talk more about the strong El Nino, what it means in this region? The, the other thing is that there's the stronger the El Nino, the more likely those are to occur. Um, that's, that's the main part about it. So. Okay, you can answer this one. Is the Bermuda high behaving normally? How does the Bermuda high behave? Honestly, <laughs> I've not I've not looked at that recently on where we are. Yeah, I've I, you know, I, I wonder if if the flow off the Gulf has not been adjusted somewhat because of the overall dry conditions. We would have expected to start seeing more humidity by this time of year, and we haven't seen as much. We're still getting rain, but the air has been somewhat drier. But I can't speak to that specifically. Yeah, and it's certainly not getting further to the west like we like to see it, right? So places like the high plains, um, yet is the key word there. So a lot of dry air still funneling in from the west southwest, um, keeping keeping the the wet pattern, if you will, especially in the southern plains to the east. And Dennis did show the uh, uh, accumulated precipitation for the next seven days. Looks like a huge amount of rain. Not so much in the high plains of the southern plains, if you will. But uh, a little further east of there, Dennis, do you want to show the QPF just to show? Uh, oh, yes. That, that's, that looks like a big deal. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's a yep. big deal. <laughs> that's a big deal. That'll be flooding for a lot of folks down there. Um, not so much in our region, um, but you do see Kansas is pretty well covered by, oh, an inch of rain, which is definitely needed badly in portions of and Oklahoma as well. Yeah. Say not our area, but Oklahoma, yes, would be a benefit for them. So we hope that comes true, really do. Um, how north has, oh, oh, here's a, here, this goes back to the question about how far south is vegetation gonna be affected. How far north has phenology advanced in order for the cold weather to impact? Yeah, and that's where I, I, I jump back to this. You know, this is the first leaf index from the National Phenology Network. Um, so southern, southern South Dakota, up into southern Minnesota, up to northern Wisconsin, we, we've advanced to there. Um, that you know there is some level of risk at that point. I would think at this northern edge, the, the well, 
problem is we're going to get pretty chilly there. Uh, I, man, yeah, I don't have a good answer off that quickly. Well, we do know, Dennis, that there are some susceptibility to some fruit trees, right? And, 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 and generally across the area, I can't remember what, I think pears and peaches and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but yeah, this area, point, this area further south down here, yeah, excuse me, typical yeah, down here. Spring, uh, late free, or I don't even know, late ish spring freeze. So, but it doesn't always have to be a late spring freeze, by the way. It can be a normal spring freeze. And it's just that we had warm weather before that. It got things going, and then it's all susceptible. Finally, uh, uh, from our friend Jerry, uh, what would the cooler outlooks lead to less active, severe weather season? You want to say anything about that? Um, you can you can swing that one. Okay, um, not necessarily. <laughs> so there's a lot of ingredients that uh, we need to to have severe weather. Uh, uh, it seems like it comes together all the time. But dry air from the west, cool air from the north or west, and then uh, plenty of moisture coming up out of the Gulf. Um, those are the key ingredients for major outbreaks, like we had in March, actually, or late, late, late March and. Um, uh, early April. Um, I don't know if there's a, a correlation between, yeah, if it stays cold the whole time, you bet. If it stays below normal, uh, sure, that may have that may have an impact on severe weather. I don't know. I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not sure that answers the question very well, but I hate to comment too much on severe weather and then have a, a big outbreak and then, you know, the typical egg on face stuff, but uh, anyway. Well, and, um, and, and that is an important point too, Doug, that, you know, there's frequent severe weather and then there's individual big outbreaks. Uh, you can have an individual big outbreak without having too many severe weather events, but have a really bad outbreak. Right. Um, like the, the Hurricane Andrew in Southern, uh, in, in, you know, that hit uh, Southern Florida. That was an overall very mild hurricane season but there was one event that was hugely impactful. So yeah. you can't have an individual event that is hugely impactful amidst not a high, not a high frequency. And you might've met Ian last year, but anyway. Um, no, I, I'm, go, I'm showing my age. I'm going oh, back to the early I'm 90s. Way back, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I don't remember, I remember Andrew. I don't remember it being a, a, a lesser year, but, uh, but I'll take your word for it. Certainly last year was sort of a, I won't say mild, but it certainly wasn't big except for that huge uh, hurricane, which was a big one. All right. Uh, I think that's it. I'm not sure we have anything else to cover at this point. Thank you all for hanging in here as long as you did. Um, we'll be back on May 19th, 18th, 19th, 18th, 18th. <laughs> it's May 18th. Okay. Confirm that with me. Uh, unless my calendar's wrong. Uh, May 18th with Justin Gleason from um, Iowa, and um, he'll give us another perspective and uh, tell us what's happening. So thank you all, and see you next month.